kick us off uh, this morning, this afternoon, excuse me. Yeah, um, this is our second training class on Cut Planner. Its focus is going to be on nesting. Cut, and cut what? Cut rock? Cut. Uh, you know what I did? I, I can't believe I turned back the clock on cut right. I said cut planner. That's kind of funny. Yeah. That is really no, weird. Say cut planner. <laughs> You'll start over? you want to start the meeting over? Or what? No, let's just keep going. Uh, everybody will get a okay. laugh out of that. Maybe it'll keep them awake a little longer. <laughs> yeah. but bottom line is, is I, um, with, cut, with cut right nesting, uh, we didn't talk much about it. Uh, but it literally uh, increased its benefits tremendously and now is way better than a lot of the competition. And um, it, it actually, it's not uh, smoke and mirrors, it's a uh, global effort. Uh, they, if they couldn't develop the algorithms correctly, they went out and found a supplier that was top shelf uh, for the algorithms and they now have uh, stay down technology. They now have uh, the best nesting algorithms out there, I guess, uh, and, and it is uh, completely mapping what microbellum can do. So if you can uh, figure out how to get a cut list out of microbellum into the cut right nesting and actually run a test, uh, you, you could get a lot of people's attention. With that, I'm going to turn it over uh, to uh, Sam and have him go through this. Okay. Thank you, Roger. Uh, hey, how's everyone doing today? Uh, so we've got uh, Daryl, Mark, Russ, myself. Is that, uh, is that everyone? And me. Okay. And, and Roger. Okay. All right. Okay, guys. Uh, thank you for joining us. We're going to go through nesting, and I think that – uh, your first goal would probably be to make this uh, a, a demo out of this look as simple and easy, quick, and efficient as possible. That that seems to always be the uh, the hallmark of a good demo from from what I've heard from many of our customers. Uh, I've got a user directory set up that's very similar to what you're already doing in WoodCAD CAM, basically importing a part list and then running it through the nesting program. I think that maybe you'll pick up on some of the new features that, that, that we have in here to offer, and I've got a, a, a couple options to, to show you how this works. Okay, so very similar to what you've been doing so far is if we import a part list, I've already got one canned up ready to go, in this is, a, is a basically one product list, and I've got a quantity of 12. Okay. All right. Import over in if the part list has already been imported, as you know, it will ask you to overwrite it. So I've already played with this a little bit, so it's asking me to overwrite it. If it's a brand new list, you won't see this this message. Now, once it opens, it takes you to view the file, and here is the list of parts that we're going to import. Okay, so we've got some uh, base filler. We've got a left side, right side, bottom, a door, shelf, back panel, adjustable shelf, and some nailers. Uh, each one of these is a com is a quantity of 12, so we're making 12 of these, this particular box. And as you're aware, we've got the job name, or these are starting here. These are the information boxes that we have available for either reading additional data or for providing information for labeling. So that's what the additional information fields that you see here are for. Um, if you don't want to see all of what we have here, I don't know if anybody's ever uh, done much with you on uh, training-wise, but you can go in and you can turn off the columns that you don't want to see. So, for instance, if I don't want to see the uh, inner opt, you know, the split, um, Field, which in this case I'm not going to use, but I'll, but if we wanted to take and turn off some of the things that we don't want to see here, you can go in and turn all the columns off, and you'll see that uh, it will streamline what we have in here in this in the field. So just continue to continuously delete out. It doesn't delete them; they're still there. They're just not viewable. Okay. So um, 
if we have uh, each item on here ready to optimize, okay, quick little tour just as a refresher for some of you guys, is that right now we're looking at a part list, and when we go to run either an optimization or a nest, it's going to write us a cutting list. And in that cutting list, it's going to have all of the individual parts that we need to process. It would also have edging pieces. If we were doing laminates, it's going to add in laminate pieces. If we were doing a uh, combination material where we cut a raw core with a face and a back from a laminate of different colors, it would include those in here as well. If we were doing grain match templates, it would put the templates in here that were properly sized to include the individual grain match parts that it was going to produce. So, so this is a, a step that you'll you you'll be may be familiar with, particularly if you were doing anything with edging or, or grain matching, and you wanted to to be a little bit more uh, detailed with your demo. Uh, what will naturally happen is that whenever we run an optimization or a nest, it will go to the board library and it will copy all of the available sheet stock sizes that match our material choices in the part list. So anything you see here was written into that board list. Okay. So now we're all set, ready to optimize. In this case, we're nesting. And here is a simple nested result. So in this result, you'll have many different summaries. Here's will be your management summary. You'll have a part summary distribution summary. This is basically uh, similar to the part list, but it'll have additional information about what you can do with the parts. The uh, pattern summaries, this breaks down all of the individual nesting patterns. Uh, it has the, uh, the number of boards, the quantity of the individual numbers of parts, number of cross cuts. Uh, some of this terminology will probably get cleaned up as we uh, get more and more proficient with our nesting, but some of it looks a little bit like the uh, panel saw results that we see. And you have a cycle time for each individual nest that we've, in, in this case, I'm, I'm quite confident that the data that I have has not been tuned in to, uh, to give us accurate costing and uh, time calculations. But that's something we can work on before the show, get you some good numbers to take out there with you. Okay. Now, any time I'm here, if I press Enter, it takes me to what we call the pattern preview screen. So, and this is how it happens to be the nested preview screen. Is that the reason that the obvious reason why all of these parts are not filled in on the, the pattern number one and pattern number six is because of the material code. So we have several different material codes that we're running through here. We've got white, 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 and this is a, a, a two-sided. Material. What is this? This is not the same material. Yeah, it is. Okay. Oh, we got some, two different materials here. Okay. One of the things that you would uh, would will help distinguish Cut Right from some of the other nesting programs is that you can go in and you can do edit the machining. So if you went to the machining drawings, machining preview, is I'm going to come to for as an example, I'm going to come to this part and just do something simple. Change the machine. You can either delete something, you can duplicate, uh, whatever you want to do. I like to go in here and do something quite simple to, to turn on is really quick is just do a cable cutout. So I'm going to cable cut out here. I'm going to resize this to be uh, 50 millimeters. Okay, you see where my cursor is. And I'm going to run a depth. Now this panel is 12.7 millimeters thick. Let's do this at 12.5 millimeter depth and the, the tool width of uh, 12.5. So we've got a cable cut out that's not cut all the way through. So it's basically a pocket at this point. But uh, there's a reason I'm going to do it that way. Now also I'm going to do another cable cut out and we'll make it um, 75 millimeters at a depth of 12.7 which is the same as the thickness and the same tool number 
12.5. So just a little bit of information there, and now that gives me, I've added two items of machining to this particular part, okay? Now, once we've got this set, there is something that you may not be familiar with. We're looking at this in a 2D view. Let's take it to a 3D view. And now we have a 3D view of that part, and I've edited it so you can see that if I go to the back of the part, what's the back to us would be the bottom, is that I do have a cable cut out all the way through, and that if I go back to the top view, I have one that's not. So we have kind of illustrated that you can edit any of these parts in this job. Now, the one thing that you will notice is that based on how the part lists were written, is that I have the part list had this end panel as one line item. This wasn't multiple line items. So when I edited this, if that quantity was 12, I edited all 12 of those parts in this list. So save changes, yes. It'll bring us back to recalculate. Escape from here, go back to the nested um, uh, nested preview, and you'll see that all of the uh, the end panels that I edited are now uh, we've adjusted the machining for them. Is that something you might, might find useful for your customers or prospective customers? Okay. Um, also, you can go in and edit the individual nesting programs. Like for instance, now I'm in the mode where I am editing the nest itself. I can come in, highlight a part, and then I can move it. So you can move it, um, you can rotate it, uh, wherever, whatever you'd like to do. For instance, uh, uh, delete it if you want it to come in here and uh, maybe, uh, maybe pick a different pattern that has some, uh, maybe some toe kick material or some spreaders and we want to add to those, we can do that as well. Save this. Automatically, well, it says we're overlapping. Okay. We'll just let it, we'll just let it overlap about that. All right. Um, another thing you might want to do is when we go back to what we call the, the nesting preview is you can change the colors as you like. So this is maybe a little bit different from some of the other um, um, programs you've, that you're using now. But what you see here is the parts are in blue, the waste is in brown, and I've changed the offcut color. Uh, right now I have it set to the white. Uh, we can make it a, a very light gray if you wanted to or, or some other color that, that that jumps out at me as, as usable material, maybe a little, something a little bit other than white, is that now I can recognize that that's an offcut piece. So if I wanted to go in and edit this, it will pretty much take the offcut out of the equation, and then we can come in and either move parts around or duplicate parts. So copy this part and of practice with this. So hit select, hit copy, and then hit paste. And now you can locate that. Let's see if we get, let's see if we can do multiples. Um, no, can't do multiples. But anyway, so now you can go in and and edit your, your patterns as well, too. And I'll have to go move. And drag that over here. So just, just take a little bit of practice. That, um, once you've, you've done it, uh, you might want to practice before you do a demo, uh, before you go out to, to Vegas, or before you get started with a customer, just so you're a little more, more, uh, more agile in the software. And then we escape here, it'll save these changes as well. Okay. So that is a, a real simple, quick 
easy demo to do. We've, we've made some impact on the, this. Um, not everybody's going to want to edit it, but it, it is, does come in handy so that uh, any time that we can do something or control something from the office that an op the machine operator doesn't have to get involved with, it makes the, the solution much more, uh, much less error prone and it much more efficient. <clears throat> okay. Any questions so far? Can you show the tool path that it, the machine tool is going to take to cut these parts out? Yes. There is an icon that shows that the mode that we're in now is going to circle every part. So this is the the, the four sided uh, the, the four sided nesting that we have here. Okay, I've got an example. I'll show you in just a second. Is I have created a uh, what we'll call a batch, where in a batch we can take a part list and we can duplicate it multiple times. All right, so that was what we were looking at. Now, now I'm going to change it. So you can see this. On the second one, I'm going to change the parameters to what we call common edge. Okay, this will be where we're taking the tool and we're dividing two parts with one blade pass. Instead of doing four sides of every part, we're going to be able to share some of the cutting with with the of the router with both two different parts. Okay. And then here I'm going to put in the same part list again. I'm hit spacebar to copy and I'm going to pick, uh, it's going to give me, a, 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 a instead of a job no, name, it's going to give me a run number. And now I'm going to do the, uh, uh, let's see, how about stay down routing? And then you can see one here that has stay down with tabs. So we'll be able to show some tabs in here as well too. Okay. All right, so when I hit this, this will optimize these and create individual jobs as a batch. And the patterns will be different and so will the graphics. And the, the layout should be fairly similar between these because it really doesn't change that much. But what you'll see is that there is a different views for the routing path. Okay. So what we looked at earlier was, was this particular job. That was basically exactly what we looked at. Now if I scroll down we're going to see that this is the routing view for this will show us that this is the this is the start point and this is the end point so it's going to go through all this machining and then it's going to exit out here so this is the start and that's the end point Okay. Let's see when we well, yeah, I have trouble, here. I, Sam, I have trouble figuring out what the path is, though. Uh, the path is way. going to – I want to make sure I've got some, everything turned on correctly. But this is showing that basically it's going to come in here, and this is – common edge cutting. So it's going to basically come in – and do I've seen some examples. I'm not exactly sure why it doesn't show you the entire path, but this is supposed to show that it comes enters the material here and then there's I think there's a line missing actually, Roger. I'm not sure why it's not showing me the entire route. But basically it's going to go around each part individually somehow and then come out right here. I've got yeah, another I mean, user folder that I may I may go to to show you I'll show you one that is uh, what I think displaying correctly, but um you can actually do there you go. There it's running now. You see it? Yeah, I see it. It's doing an animated tool path? Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, it's, it looks like it's, you know, I don't understand why it's doing it the way it's doing it. Yeah, I mean, I mean that's not common line cutting. Yes, it is. That's definitely common line cutting. You know what? It could be, it's Daryl here, it could be the way the simulation is running. If you've ever run a CNC machine, that when a tool is turning clockwise and it's going clockwise around a part, it's, it's called climb milling, so that the tool is turning inward to the part. Um, if you were to cut certain material where you're uh, conventional milling, that is where you're going counterclockwise, but the bit is turning in a clockwise rotation, it could actually blow out the corners of the material. So th that might have something to do with why it's taking the path that it is. That's, I've, it's just, that's my experience because I've run a CNC router. Yeah. Have you run a CNC it, router with common line cutting, Daryl? Yes, I If it weren't common line cutting, it would have gone around every part individually. Yeah. It was doing kind of a double pass on some of them, but it wasn't going to the corner in a clock, counterclockwise direction with the bit turning clockwise because it would have blown out the bottom left corner on the far left of the nest. That's what I picked up from it. We can speed it up if you want to see it run a little faster. I don't care about speed. I just want to understand the logic behind it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it seems to me like in a common line cutting situation, it wouldn't go back to where it's already been. And in this case, it is going back to where it's already been. But there's a logical reason what Daryl is saying is is that I don't quite understand what that logical reason is. Where would it? Can you show me how it would cut? Full out direction and, and the approach you make around the corner could cause chipping. Is what he's basically saying. Yeah. We could probably find someone who uh, I'm. When it comes to application, uh, I, I'm more familiar with, much more familiar with the saws. I'm still, I have a learning curve when it comes to routers, when it comes to applications. Uh, I'm not going to dispute, uh, I'm, I'm not going to mislead you with the information to, to suggest otherwise. Okay. All right, so this would be common line cutting. All right, uh, if we go back to the next job, this would be stay down routing. Use the same pattern again. And in here, we'll turn on the uh, routing view and we'll run the animation. So, does, does everyone understand the, uh, the, the premise of Stay down routing. There's two advantages. First is faster because you're not retracting and inserting the bit every time that you go from one part to the next. The second advantage is on tool life is that those router bits are designed to cut angularly, not vertically. It creates you made a, heat. a big drill yeah. out of it. When a, so when a it's, rotor it's bit plunges in, improves tool life. Yeah. So these are a lot of the features that, uh, when it comes to nesting programs, you, you need to have these. We now have them. We haven't always had them until one of the more recent versions. It came in like 70, uh, excuse me, 1002, I believe. So there you have it. That is. The, uh, the stay down rounding, you can do a combination of the two. And also, we uh, had another example to look at, which was, uh, I believe it was uh, stay down with tabbing. And the tabs are just as they, just as you would assume they would be, is that you have material that 
it ramps up Lee's uh, connection piece, ramps back down to table level so that she's, these pieces are connected. And if we run the animation on that, so two times speed, it's going to run the same path, but it, it doesn't distinguish that it's rising for the tabs, but you can see that the tabs are, are here. There are parameters to control how often you get a tab. Parts below a particular size uh, that you specify will not get a tab. So it's a, a great way to um, keep parts from moving, particularly small parts. Sam, when um, you change from tabbing to stay down to common line cutting, I don't see where, can you hover over where you were changing that? Um, this is where I, I changed the view. So you had a, this is what we came into the, the this is the default display when we come into the edit mode. Okay. So here we are, we're in, um, let's go back, let's start here, start over right here. Let's pick a different one, how about that? Um, let's go to this one. So now we are in the review screen of this particular nesting program. In order to edit this, I double click and it takes me into the edit mode. In edit mode, I can move these parts around as we did earlier when we took this part and moved it, moved it around to a different location. Um, you can insert parts, you can, you can just add parts wherever you like. But to get it to what we were just looking at is I changed from the pattern view to the routing view. You see this icon mark? Yes, thank you. You got that. And then in order to to run the animation is you have can change the speed. Let's change it to two times speed and hit play. I'm assuming it gives you cycle times if you want to compare common line versus stay down. Um, I don't have any reliable feedback from the machine group on what those times should be. I think that uh, we can get that uh, in a user directory that you guys can take with you to Atlanta. At least something serviceable. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't uh, guarantee. T, anytime you, when it comes to guaranteeing cycle times, we, uh, we don't do that uh, carte blanche. We will have a customer pick out a given number of patterns, say, okay, these are five typical patterns. They will hand calculate the uh, cycle time feed rate, you know, set the feed rate based on their, their tool path and uh, their, their, their tool speed expectation, and then give them a, a guaranteed cycle time on time very specific. However, you can point out that you can control that and set that where you can get really good reliable estimates from the nesting and the optimizing program. Okay. Any questions? Uh, is there a summary of the cycle time uh, that we can look at on this particular Actually, there pattern? Is. On this particular pattern, well, let's, uh, that's a good question. Let's get out of, well, I'm going to have to exit out of the edit mode. And here, you know, let's see, these, this is a list of the parts. This is uh, in, in nested pieces. It's not quite as informative as it is with the pattern. But if you go to the pattern summary, that would be, and these are just whatever numbers are in the system by default, okay? So this is the total calculation for as the settings are, are happen to be set at the moment. It just came from Bath this way. I don't, I don't know if any, any of our guys have tweaked to turn these into something that uh, is germane to the actual performance of uh, the machine in question. Yes, number of uh, number of boards, um, cycle times, uh, number of open parts, which is I'm surprised to see that in nesting actually, but I'm glad to see it. And this is the uh, the, the router program name as it's going to to be displayed at the machine controller. 
Okay. So that particular, um, char that particular page that you're showing is only to do with one sheet, correct? One pattern. That this would be like, for instance, this would be for um, two cycles at 435 each. So that would add add to that. Meaning you ran the same pattern twice. I don't know why it's got 50 on it. These numbers look uh, kind of weird. The cycle time is only two of those. It should be nine minutes and 10 seconds. I don't know why it's got 50. Maybe we have a question I'll, I'll, I'll find out about what we're looking at either, either I'm misreading or it's not displaying correctly. Total. Rounding time. Hey, uh, Roger and Sam, question before I forget. Um, I think our first session at the end, we realized that Sam had some stuff that we didn't have, so you were going to send the data set, if that's the correct terminology that you have to Roger and Roger to us so either you did and Roger didn't send it to us or I just missed it no I'm, I'm, <clears throat> I spoke with Alan about that and uh, right now I'm you know without without discussing it with him beforehand I was going to send you a, a using directory that I have here um, however I think he's got something that more specific in mind and that we'll, Mal and I will work out. You guys will have a, 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 a working user directory for optimizing and for nesting before you, before you head out. So, and it'll be distributed amongst everybody, but uh, exactly what we're going to put in your hands, we don't know yet. So I'll check with Alan. Okay. Um, all right. So any questions on that? You've got, I mean, you should be, these should be familiar from what you've seen in the optimizing program. If you've been working with that, is you got a management summary, show you how many parts. Um, if you allowed overages, it would show you how many over parts, or if you edited in new parts that weren't in the original part list, they would show up in the over parts. You'd also see your waste percentages, um, the cutting time. I'm, doesn't look like it matches the the pattern summary times. So it looks like we've got uh, two hours and 52 minutes here. And while we have one hour and one minute uh, doesn't job, does it? And these may be some good to know questions so that if you're don't hang yourself in your demo by knowing that they they will be different and okay um, part summary this is basically a, 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 a what you have in your part list is a very much a duplication of that and then you have your your previews and you have your Machining. See, these are these are under each tab. You see, got different tabs here. You got your nesting, nesting preview. And you have nesting patterns. And you have your machining preview, and machining drawings, and your editors. Um, on that editor that you were just showing, the drawing of that one single part, right there, I can edit the part also. In this yes, we we uh, the example where we went in and I put the, the cable cutouts. Yes. On the part. Yeah. Yeah. That was that was what we did. We did that in the the machining editor. Okay, um, Sam. In that particular example that you showed, um, you put it on one part and it showed up on all parts. 
What if I just want to put it on one part and not have it show up on all parts? Okay. In order to do that, you would have to go to back to the part list, and I'll, I'll take you there and show you show you how to uh, to just to, 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 to illustrate that example. So we go back to this part list that, that we had imported earlier. In order to do that, I would have to come in here and go edit, insert a line, and let's see. Here's the side panel. Let's go. Do it here. So I'm going to come to line directly below. I'm going to edit, insert a line, and I'm going to copy. You can't change this name. Okay, so this name can't change. Same material. And I'm going to make this a quantity of 11 and this a quantity of 1. Now I can change it here. Find um, A. So now I've got a different item to work with. Okay. And hit space. And hit space bar copies from the item, item directly above me. Um, okay. And scroll back over. And now when we run the, op, the Nest program, you'll see that we have 11 of one. If I edit all 11, they will be the same if I edit just the one. They have to be different line items because you can't edit three of the 12. It has to be three and nine to do that. And if we look at the uh, machining editor, we'll see that we have that end panel selection. See how we have uh, part number two and three the same. This is a quantity of 11. And this is a quantity of one. If I only wanted one cable cut out, I'd have to get to do it that way. So you just double clicked it. Yep, I double clicked the one that had quantity of one. Okay. Right here. Okay. Cable cut out. Yep. Seven, twelve, and then we go back to our nested programs. <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm a little ahead of myself. See, only one of them has a uh, cable cut out. Is item number three. The other eleven do not have a cable cut out in it. Okay. But it's really simple. You know, if you do find yourself in that situation, it's it's so easy to nest and so quick. It's really not very inconvenient to pop out of a run and duplicate it and then come back in. Yeah, Sam, where did these parts come from? These actually come from WoodCAD CAM. Okay, so we walk into an account that doesn't have WoodCAD CAM, uh, and they have AutoCAD, and they're drawing, and they're drawing parts and programming in some other way. What, what do we say? What do we do? Um, well, what you want to focus on for that type of customer is that we have multiple. Um, I'm just throwing this as we were as we were chatting is that we have multiple sources for machining. You can use the cut right machining library. You can use import DXS, which is what we all familiar with with WoodCAD CAM. And we can also import wiki MPR files. Okay. The wiki MPR files are actually the trick here of the three door because a typical customer that you might encounter may have a point-to-point -point pod and rail machine and 
when it comes to programming those individually, there are a lot of assumptions you can make because you're not having two parts in close proximity as you do with nesting. So they may have to edit their NPR files such as going in and adding a, a contour around a, um, um, an end panel that has a toe kick cut into it in order to be able to nest parts that have angled uh, tops to them, so like a corner shelf. If it's got an angled surface to it, in order to take advantage of being able to have that nest beside another part, is that you would have to draw the contour of the angle cut so that the parts could be inserted into the void that you would be cutting off of it if you were drawing it rectangularly. So there are some editing that may need to be done to a customer's library of NPR files. Um, depending on how much use of parametrics and how much use of what they call components, a component is a program within a program. They have an NPR program that has to be called from a specific location in order to be inserted into the nesting program. If it's not available, if those components are scattered out throughout their network, they'll have to be copied and modified into the system. So it, it is doable, but you're probably, generally speaking, it's, it's advisable that we have a conversation about collecting some data, running it through our nesting program and see what we encounter when it comes to that. Now, when it comes to DXF files, if you have an AutoCAD user, all he really needs to do is be able to control the names of his layers. So when it, if he's using layer names and uh, we just register those layer names in the, uh, in the cut right layer name rules and uh, it knows what to do with it whenever it sees it by the layer name. Can you show, it, uh, show us what those rules are and where they are? Okay, sure. Escape from here and we go to parameters and we have DXF layer name rules. And you can have different lists. So I'm not the author of these, but I can kind of go through them with you here, is that these are the layer names. And the system is actually relatively smart in that it will go in uh, to a folder of DXF files and read all the layer names in that folder and then populate a list for you, and then you come down, come along, and you edit what each one of those layers uh, is is doing for you. Hopefully, uh, whoever's creating the layer names is uh, including some type of uh, logical name to the layer so that it's a little easier to edit when you get in here. You can also see that you can change depth by using the layer name. So if the layer name includes the depth of, uh, has this little string of characters here, the software will know to, to read the depth from the layer name as well. So this, this is not the, the simplest looking list of layer name rules, but um, it, it is what it is for uh, the the wood CAD CAM. So that's, that's just typically a wood CAD CAM uh, starter list right here. Are you guys seeing this for the first yeah, time or do you don't. know this? Daryl, is this snooty? Is this, is, have you seen this before? Yeah, I went through some of this stuff uh, oh, two weeks ago with Scott, Scott Glatzel. Okay. Um, do, do you, do, I mean, I've never really bothered to, if somebody says they're drawing with AutoCAD and pushing it into AlphaCam and they want a solution for both optimization and nesting, uh, they would have to build their, their parts in this layer format. Have I got that right? Well, I think it's just because you're assigning a tool to a layer. That's why. Yeah, and you've you've got path, you know, um, you know, which whether you're doing clockwise, counterclockwise, yeah. whether your uh, geometries run center line or is uh, 
all set left or right. Um, different things that would be common to people who run CMC machines, they're going to recognize this pretty readily because this is really all we're changing is we're, 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 we're picking which, which type of uh, feature of the machine we're going to use to process this particular dimension. And then we've got tool number three, RK2 equals tool path to the left. It, the most, this is very common among all the different machine centers. Right. So if you if you go into a, an account and they're drawing parts in AutoCAD and they're using some other uh, nesting program, uh, would you be able to go ahead and, and take those drawings of those parts and put them into this, or do you have to redraw them? Oh, we don't have to redraw them. No, we don't have to redraw them. Is that we a cut right is sets you set a path and the cut right either knows by the name of the part or one of the information boxes which DXF is to process line item one. Like when we so it knows which DXF part file goes with which part. What they're basically doing is they're saying, okay, well I'm going to draw in either in two D and whenever I draw I just pick a different, and the simple terminology is a different crayon. Is that my, my this layer orange is a crayon for the border route, and I'm going to circle my part with that, the perimeter of my part, or or what is the uh, uh, the 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 residue part of the machining, which is the angle like the angle shelf, and then if I'm going to do a, a pocket. I'm going to pick a different crayon, and that layer name is pocket. It can be, it can be much much simpler than what you have here. This is just something that uh, our, uh, I guess, our integrators or who or our friends at Home Maggie Solutions who, who created some data decided to to use these names instead of something very very simple looking. But none, be that as it may, uh, every uh, line, arc, curve, whatever on a part has to be assigned a specific layer to communicate to the uh, well, it's, you, to what it's, it needs to do. It's, it's not, now don't be confused because it's not the tool instruction. It's basically, uh, it's, it's not the individual segments of that arc or the perimeter. That's all drawn as one in AutoCAD and all we're doing is telling it that the name of the crayon that we use to draw it with. So in a in a, the typical DXF file, most people will put different colors for different layers, and that's why they um, use the crayon analogy. I understand that, but when you when you're drawing a part, uh, it's laying it down in one layer, and then if I need to change the layer, don't I have to go to the layer menu, change the layer, and then start drawing and uh, continue the line? Yeah, you're basically laying down one crayon and picking up another when you draw from. Uh, from your horizontal board to doing your shelf holes. You just lay down one crayon and pick up another. I'm not, an, I'm, I haven't done much with AutoCAD in about a decade. So I guess. Yeah, I think one of the things, Roger, that you can do, if you're talking to someone um, who's, you know, an engineer, drafter, they're going to understand um, about creating layers uh, for certain tools to use. So when they're drawing their AutoCAD 2D stuff and they're cr creating a cabinet side, a gable or a side panel, they're typically going to draw shelf clip holes on a separate layer. But if, for some reason, they drew all the geometry, including the toe kick, the outside profile, um, the eight millimeter dowel holes, the five millimeter shelf clip holes, and they drew it all on the same layer. Um, and you imported that into Cutrite. Well, Cutrite wouldn't be able to really do a whole lot with it, other than assigning, Nothing. you know, a tool. It, yeah. So if you're talking to a guy and you're saying, "Hey, you have to put five millimeter shelf clip holes on a certain layer, eight millimeter holes on a on another layer," 
Then when you import it into CutRight, CutRight's tool is going to recognize either the diameter of that geometry or the layer that it was drawn on, and then a tool is assigned to that layer so it can automatically tool path it. It's called ATP, Automatic Tool Pathing, and that's what I see CutRight uses. It's much like Mastercam, AlphaCam, many of the others that I've used. It's, it's just they'll understand that you have to draw your AutoCAD on those layers. Now the cool thing is in AutoCAD you can very quickly highlight all the five millimeter holes and change it and create a new layer name. It's like seconds to do it. So that's that's not going to be a, a hindrance. It's just and they'll understand that. It's they'll any AutoCAD user will go, oh that's nothing. Like I can quickly do that no problem. So I, be, I would avoid okay. the conversation about the automatic tool pathing because that was is actually something that uh, CAM programs are more oriented to making logical decisions about the geometry that they see. We're relying on a tool path. So whenever you draw it, the way that you draw it should be consistent so that you can use consistent tool path yeah. so that your tool will stay on the outside of that, that line that you're drawing. It's interesting that with what this does is it it, it certainly uh, when you have to manage layers when you're doing a part it certainly opens you up to making a mistake. So if this guy so now he has to you know I'm just I'm just thinking in terms of doing it doing a manual part for cut right or alpha cam or anything and then having to make sure that you've got it right on for the size of the holes, the layers, and the curves, and, and all of that, to make sure you've got it right on, you got to be pretty damn good. And even if you're um, real good, there's still going to be a percentage, a percentage of mistakes that happen because somebody forgets something. Uh, and those things I haven't really been using to, uh, to my fullest advantage. Because it seems to me, Daryl, correct me if I'm wrong, you know, with a product like uh, WoodCAD Cam, boy, it would really cut out a lot of manual work and also cut out a lot of mistakes if you're doing this with just yeah, wrong. Yeah, and I, wrong I, think your, I think your conversation evolves from showing them the technology, explaining this to them, and just saying, but if you had WoodCAD Cam, you wouldn't have to worry about you know doing all this stuff because when I worked in the shop and I had drafting guys AutoCAD drafters creating 2D parts and I was nesting it in a cam software there'd be a lot of times where you know maybe they drew two lines on top of each other um, and so when you're toolpathing something it would recognize those two lines uh, sitting on top of one another and you'd have to have clean geometry in order to do a toolpath or maybe there'd be uh, a small segment, a space in between two connecting lines where the tool couldn't actually recognize that as an outside border. Um, so that definitely can open up the door to saying you know if you're drawing in WoodCAD CAM you're not going to have any of these problems but this is a solution for today, but going forward in the future, it would make much more sense for you to buy WoodCAD CAM and then not have any of these mistakes that potentially could happen. Yeah. Well, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting, uh, it's interesting. You, you know, if they have nothing, then, then cut right makes sense. If they have, you know, alpha cam and a separate optimizer and they're manually uh, Sam made the statement that you'd have to. It doesn't make any difference whether it's Alpha Cam, Master Cam, or Cut Right. You have to have the layers correct. Yeah. And uh, so there's a huge advantage to have something controlling your geometry with proper layering. Uh, that. Uh, and if if they want, but I mean, one thing that you will know is that if the DXF file, we're looking at the DXF files as a preview in from the part list and Cut Right is if they were to use, wanted to put some notes on one of their drawings, as long as that 
layer that they write the note in is not in our list, we ignore it. It just if the layer name is not named in this the list that we looked at earlier, it's ignored. Now the problem with the biggest problem with using a, uh, a manually oriented drawing program is labeling. It you you really don't have a good vehicle to get information about that part over to a labeling system. WoodCAD CAM takes care of all that for you. The way that we're bringing in this is that in our example here, the part list is providing the pertinent layering information for us, and that is, is something that needs to be uh, pointed out as well, is in order to, to, to drive even an MPR or a DXF-oriented nesting program, you'll still need a part list of some sort to accommodate that, to itemize the, the bill of material, so to speak, or and provide the labeling information to the labeling systems. Okay, a lot of, a lot so, of angles so basically, to, to so keep, basically keep the digging answer, back at, at Wood Cam. But basically, what did you say, Sam? I didn't get that. There are a lot of ang there are a lot of points here that will, you can revert the conversation back to having ha having something like Wood Cat Cam that will handle the layering, the drawings, and the labeling information all, all simultaneously while you draw. And accentuate the, the advantage of wood can that way. Yeah, I think it, you know, for someone, let's say, who's using microvellum, who wants to get better yield, better nesting results, you can, this is the doorway, the segue into opening up this conversation. <coughs> Once you've shown them, <coughs> you know, and talked about this, doing, you know, three or four cabinets in a drawing, processing that, importing it into cut right, and hitting optimize and going boom there it is you know so uh, your first logical step yeah would be getting cut right you know to imp improve your yield and things like that but step two is if you're gonna get woodcad cam now look at you know there's a couple of clicks and we've got the same result uh, but you know everything's already automatically layered and, and stuff like that so you don't have to worry about matching your data and microvellum so it comes into cut right you know, recognizing the tool, um, I think it's just, uh, it's definitely, you know, you get your foot in the door and then just push it open. So, uh, Daryl, I think what you're saying is, is that if it's a microvellum customer, they're already, they're using microvellum, which also makes a layer DXF automatic, correct? Yeah, it, they do a pretty decent job at consistently giving layer names. I mean, they, their, their typical problem that I've run into is not so much that their net, that their layering, their DXS are a problem. There probably are some examples contrary to that, but their biggest problem is they really don't like the nesting results or the performance of the nesting program uh, with microvellum. Yeah. Okay, so what you're doing is you're walking in the door saying, hey, I got a nesting solution. Uh, that's superior to microvellums. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. So you're using this to break the door down. Mm -hmm. and right. You're, and you're and, doing and this. many of those will already have, uh, and you you probably will encounter a lot of already existing cut right packages in there for optimization. Okay. Wouldn't be surprised. Okay. Uh, pretty and when it comes that's, to that's pretty interesting. They, so what you're saying is is all we have to do is get cut right to match their layering process one time and then you're done. Well I, I Roger, are you familiar with Kent Swenson at Timberline? Oh yeah. Okay. Kent um, has done some comparative analysis. I don't have in my hands on it. Sean may be able to to help with that. But uh, from what I understand, he, he's got a, a pretty savvy case about why Cutright is uh, significantly s superior nesting program and, and worth the expense to, to upgrade. Okay. 
we need to get. I don't know whether it's based on the the actual time of the nesting or the route or the control points that you have. It's probably a combination of multiple things. Uh, and when it comes to rectangular nesting, which this job was almost um, entirely, you throw enough parts in here. Um, I did. I don't know if they've gotten any better, and I I haven't heard anything that would suggest they have. But uh, back when we first started nesting, I did some uh, work for a water jet. Um, people using a water jet, all all steel, and we had to do. The nesting program three times because we were beating them 15 percent, 17 percent, 21 percent, and they said there's there's no way. So we had to keep doing it over and over again. And I'm pretty sure it was router sim that they were we were up against. Is that the the algorithms from the cut right optimizing program are just so much better for uh, fitting parts together in, in a panel that it was um, it was unbelievable how much better it was, and they. Because you, know, you can see that it's, it's really hard to look at a screen and look at nested patterns or, or cutting patterns and really distinguish how much one is better than the other until you look at the summaries and you compare the two on the same screen. Because I'd seen some patterns that people would send over from uh, from cut plan. I'm like, you know, these don't look all that bad. They don't look all that bad. And then I run them through there and we do it 20% faster and use 12.5% uh, uh, less sheets. Just, that's against uh, that's against router sim. Uh, that again, the last was against uh, pattern systems. I mean, multi -time. even artists. We have, I've never done a study where we didn't beat our artists that they weren't cheating. They would go in and modify their part list, and they would throw out their scrap patterns, and they didn't realize that I could see the actuals and the requireds were all different, and that they were uh, they were sandbagging their results with the uh, with. Uh, a skewed part list. Okay. All right. Uh, I had scheduled this for one hour, uh, Sam. We're at an hour and four minutes. Um, okay. We, we probably should wrap up and figure out where we're going to go next. Okay. I'm going to get you some cut right selling points for both nesting and optimizing in, in a nice little document and get it your way soon. We'll, me and, me and Alan will figure out something about uh, you know, getting you some user profiles to work with. I would suggest the, um, we focus on DXF because I think that's where the bulk of the market will be in nesting opportunities. There will be some cut right uh, part library. They're just as easy as showing nesting. You can just say, um, we can take a different approach if you do encounter some of those. And I really wouldn't flag down anyone who's using NPR. I would just, if they do have an NPR source, they already have wikis. Um, you know, we can we can say, yeah, we we we'll need to look at your data, but we can do NPRs as well. I'll, I'll, tell, you what, I'll tell you what meat and help us is is that if you can get a uh, setup for microvellum layers in uh, Cutrite, we can go into a microvellum user and say, give me a cut list and the data and put it in this and then show them a, show them the comparison um, without, without a lot of drama I, that i don't know how much i don't i really don't know roger whether it's that simple or not i don't know whether they're configurable or whether uh, they're they use a, a stock set uh, i'm not stock, sure exactly set, what their data looks like yeah they do have a stock set uh we we used to sell it all the time and we never had to mess with that mark Mayberry, do you know anything about that? It may start as a stock, but there's no guarantee that integrators don't tweak it as they go along. Uh, I would doubt if they uh, change the layering format. I would really uh, doubt Well, that. maybe maybe Kent maybe Kent Swenson can uh, can give us some uh, a heads up on that aspect. He may know. Yeah, I mean, I think if we're going to actually go after this, because we were actually nesting his microvellum DXF files, so so there you go. At one point, so yeah, we we've done it there. We've done it a couple other places too, but I know we've done it there. So it's just a matter of changing the layering format and cover. Yeah, right and he but he started. He actually he actually the layer names were were a bit of a problem because um, 
our layer names didn't originally include dimensions, and I think they do now, is that you had to, you had to tweak the uh, output or either capture and rename some of his layers in order to make them work, but it was something, uh, I'm not sure how much tweaking was done to that. Okay. All right, well, we'll touch base with Kent, too, and see if we can get him to not only write up, but okay. talk us through it. Hey, Roger. Yes, one, sir. One, one quick thing is if we get a microvellum customer in front of us, we need to ask them if they are utilizing their technology for common line cutting, because I didn't ever, in the 10 years I sold, that uh, feature within microvellum, not one person said that it worked. And what I saw today was a little bit unique, the way the tool paths were working. So that just kind of leads me to believe that uh, a cut right's got, you know, something in it that is working that, you know, what microvellum showed was very sexy. It looked like a saw blade going in between each part. Mark Mayberry actually noticed that. Um, you know, it just made one line in between each one. It moved to the next one, made one line. But it just it didn't work when you actually ran it on a router because of corners getting blown out. And that's what the customers were telling me. So they weren't using that technology. But we should ask them if they are using that and is it working. And if they say no, then that can open the door too. Well, I just have trouble imagining that it actually doesn't work because I know that Dave Peel spent one night programming common line cutting. One night. So, I mean, you know, when you think about that, and he probably hasn't touched it since, that explains an awful lot. Because I, I experienced the same thing, Daryl. No one, I, I sold it, but nobody used it. And nobody told me why they didn't use it, but it sure makes sense why they didn't use it, based on what we learned today. I don't know. It seems like a place to, to get some gold. You, you guys will probably run into a lot of Cabinet Vision or Planet customers out at, out west. They, they're, that's typically a hotbed for them. Um, and I don't know if this is too early to say or not, but we've kind of come up with a way that we can um, – the way that they do their grain matching is, unfortunately, we, we've had – didn't have a solution – until recently that would allow us to set up grain matching for uh, planet patterns for parts so we were saying okay well you're you're going to do grain matching you're stuck with their optimizer they're not stuck anymore uh, I can get some more information from uh, our tech guys that are working on that but using the the layer name the, excuse me the cutting list rules there appears to be a very highly probable way that we can offer and read part lists from planet and then assign a, a layered name template to it from our system so um, we may have some good news to, to go after at least getting the the nesting and the the cut right uh, sales from people who aren't particularly happy with planets optimizer and nesting program okay Sam let's have a uh another meeting Thursday where you can pull all this information together Thursday night same time and uh, yeah, look, gonna... tentatively yes I will I'll, I'll be happy if I can get everything together and get all the answers I need by then yeah we, I'll be happy to do that um, well but, yeah, we're, we're, we're all leaving for the show this weekend or Monday so it'd be nice to have that to get ready not all I'll, of us, I'll, we'll, we'll make it happen the show. okay all right. Okay. Um, anything else we need to go over? Or you think your team's uh, at least warmed up? I I'm I feel better about it. We'll we'll get that we'll get this out in front of people and see what they say. Um, yeah. you'll know it doesn't make any difference what we say now. You'll know when we start selling cut right as a standalone or substituting cut right to be hooked up to cabinet vision or knocking out microvellum, then you'll know we're, we're on to it. Yeah. I, I think that, you know, this is something that Sean and I uh, have been kind of brushed on the subject of multiple times is, you know, uh, having a, an in-house expert 
on nesting that can work with your guys and collect data, do testing? I mean, you know, uh, I don't know if, if that's an, uh, something, but it would come in really handy, particularly with nesting, because there's a lot of opportunity there. But there is some legwork that you you may have to do to um, give that realistically your data demo that uh, will, will seal deals for. Yeah, that that that's true. That's why I think it's important that we figure out how to have a uh, testing layer for microvellum and a testing layer. We'll figure out what we're going to do with cabinet vision. I mean, that'll give us an opportunity to walk into every factory. Okay. If you can get some, you know, someone to, to collect some data and then see what's different from the different sources, it, it, may, it may be so obvious that it's all the same is that, you know, we can, there's, there's only so much machinery you can do anyway um, and, and work from that. Uh, but if, it's, if it all comes off and everybody's unique uh, layer names and unique paths and, and the tools are no big deal, we can, we can, we can it, swap out two I'm, I'm very telling easy. you, I'm telling you, uh, they're the same because I've never heard conversations about it, about people adjusting their layer file. I mean, okay. for all those years, I never heard any of that. I heard a lot of conversations, but not that. So, okay. okay, man. Well, we'll set it all up right. for Thursday right. and go from there. Okay, Roger. Have a all good one. Right. Thanks a lot. See you.